Hi there, Dan here with the second part of my Learn Audio DSP YouTube tutorial series. If you're seeing this, hopefully you've seen part one of the video and you enjoyed it. If not, you can go ahead and go back and check that out. For those of you who didn't see part one of this series, we generated a simple sine wave at one kilohertz. And those of you who are familiar with synthesizers and electronic music production will know that there are a lot more interesting waveforms that we can generate and use to make sounds or uses modulation sources or other things. For example, in this video, we're going to be generating a square wave, a saw wave, and a triangle wave. These waveforms all have a more interesting shape and timbre than the sine wave that we generated before, and can be used to generate a lot of different synthesizer sounds, or can be used to create a lot of interesting modulations in our music. We're gonna be using some pretty simple techniques in order to generate these waveforms directly by basically drawing in the waveforms that we want. So those of you who are experienced with DSP might be a little bit alarmed at the discontinuities in the waveforms at first, but they should still sound good for our purposes. In fact, I think that these waveforms sound kind of like retro video game sounds. I'm kind of, I've kind of been inspired by Red Bull Music's Digging in the Cart series featuring some of my favorite artists like Flying Lotus, where they go in and talk about uh, the kind of retro video game sounds that inspired them in their current music. And I think that since the hardware back then had a lot simpler controls over the sounds, that this kind of basic waveform generation with aliasing kind of sounds similar to the techniques that they used for that kind of music generation. But before we start a discussion on waveforms today, we first need to talk about sampling. So those of you who are into electronic music that features clips of sounds taken from vinyl records or other loops, as is frequently done in hip hop. Hear the drama get wicked. You might be a little bit confused about what the term sampling means in our context. So for a lot of electronic music production, sampling means taking a snippet of a recording and putting it in your music and kind of artistically reinventing that bit of recorded audio. However, we're going to talk about here is a totally different meaning. In DSP, sampling means taking a continuous valued signal and looking at it at very specific points in time in order to get the value of it. What this means is in our resulting digital audio signals, we don't know the value at every point in time in between the samples, which are the places where we do know the value of the signal. Now, it turns out that this isn't a big deal, and we can perfectly reproduce all frequencies that happen below a half of our sampling rate, or the Nyquist frequency. For more information on this, you can check out the ziff.org video on digital audio myths, where they kind of debunk a lot of uh, myths around digital audio and what it can and can't represent. But basically it tells us that even on cheaper or older hardware, we can still reproduce analog signals super, super well with digital audio sampling techniques. So let's get started with some examples of sampling. Let's go ahead and pull up octave And I pull up octave.app from my applications. So one thing that we're going to look at today is the use of the editor in Octave. What the editor lets you do is write in a script all at once and save it for later or run it interactively so you can kind of try out different steps easier. Like in our last video, we used the command window in order to type in commands interactively, but what that means is it's harder to go back and redo commands that you run in the command window. So we're going to be using the editor in order to make our uh, scripts for today. So first I want to give you an example of what sampling kind of looks like inside a computer. The waveform that we generated in the first video actually was a sampled waveform, but I kind of glossed over the details of that. So let's go ahead and dig into that now. First thing, we're going to generate a single cycle of a sine wave. So remember, lines that start with the percent sign like this are comments and don't contain code, just notes to us as humans. So first, let's generate our waveform. Let's make a variable called waveform. Say equals sine of 2 pi. And then we're going to use the lin space command to evenly distribute 40 samples, this third argument is 40, between the values 0 and 1. 
So what this will give us is a sine wave in the variable waveform that is 40 elements long. Go ahead and close all the parentheses here. So the first thing we're going to do with this waveform is plot it as if it were an analog signal. So now keep in mind that these are all digital signals, but this is what it would look like if it was an analog signal. So we'll write a little comment here, plot the continuous version. So first thing we're going to do is generate a figure. We type the command figure. It will bring up a new window for us to draw a graph in. Use the command plot to draw our waveform. And we're going to title this continuous waveform. Now remember the single quotes here give us a string so that we can name our figure. It's going to use this continuous waveform text as the title. And while we're on the topic, let's go ahead and label our x-axis. So we're going to use x label, single quote, time in samples. This is the unit of our time in the x-axis. So next, let's plot the discrete or sampled version. So we can highlight our commands from before, copy them, and paste them here. So we'll be using mostly the same thing. But let's change the plot to the command called stem. We'll draw the waveform in a different way. So we're going to change the title here to sampled waveform. X-axis is still time in seconds. So let's go ahead and click the gear with the play button in order to save the file and run. And first it'll tell us that we need to save the file somewhere. For our purposes, I'm going to make a new folder that contains the files from this video. I'm going to call it Learn Audio DSP Part 2. Let's go in here and let's save this as sampling underscore example. This will create a .m file. So it's going to tell us that we need to change directory to that new folder that we just created. Let's go ahead and change there. So if we look at the waveforms that came out, we see one figure of the continuous waveform and one of the sampled waveform. So now what you see here on the left is what our sine wave would look like if it was an analog signal. And we knew what the waveform looked like at all points in time. However, this is kind of cheating because in digital audio, we don't know what the signal looks like at all points in time. What we really have is this sampled waveform. All we know is that at certain discrete points in time in samples, we know that here the value is zero, and then it goes up to one, and then it goes back down to negative one, and then back to zero. We don't actually have any idea what the signal looks like in between these samples. However, using some clever bits of math that smart people have generated for us before, we know that we can perfectly reproduce this waveform when it goes out of our computers and into our speakers. So I might draw more waveforms that look like this in the future, but forgive me, it just makes it easier to look at than this. But this is actually more accurate for what we are creating. One important thing to notice about both of these signals is that they vary between the values of 0, 1, and negative 1. So in digital audio, you can think of 1 as the maximum value that we can represent, and negative 1 as the minimum value. And these represent how our speaker cone moves forward and backward when it oscillates and sends signals acoustically. So in digital audio, we need to create signals that vary in between 1 and negative 1, or anywhere in between, in order to create different sounds. So now that you have an intuition for what sampled waveforms look like, let's go ahead and dive into making a square wave example. So let's go ahead and close our two figures that we made from before. And let's resize our command window so that it takes up some more space so we can play around with some interactive examples. Let's type CLC to clear our command window so we can get started with some other stuff. So in order to generate a square wave, we'll first need a series of samples with the value 1 and then a series of samples with the value negative 1. So the octave command 1s will help us out a lot. So first, let's call the command 1s with the first argument of the value 1, meaning we want one row in our resulting vector, comma, 4, close parentheses. We hit enter here, what it will return is four 1s. So again, this is one row long 
and four columns wide. So this can generate the first part of our square wave, all of the values starting with one. Next thing we'll need is some values negative one. So let's do some math on the result of the ones function. We can say negative one times ones, parentheses one comma four. Enter, gets us all negative ones. So if you remember from the first part of the series, we can do math on vectors simply using the built-in uh, operations. So here we use the asterisk to mean multiplication. So we have negative one times four different values of one. And what we can do is concatenate or basically shove these two together into one vector. So if we create a, another vector using the bracket and then ones, parentheses one comma four, close parentheses comma, and then let's do the negative one part. So negative one times ones, one, four, close parentheses, close bracket. If you hit enter here, you'll see that we have a resulting vector that's four ones and then four negative ones. Now this is basically a square wave. We can plot this using plot ones, one, comma, four, comma, negative one times ones, one comma four parentheses. Oh, sorry. I forgot the square brackets here. Square brackets around that. Parentheses plot. And what get, that gets us is a square wave. Now we might need to zoom out in order to see it properly. But this is one cycle of a square wave. So this works as kind of a proof of concept of our waveform, but we need to put in a little bit more structure before we can use this as an audio signal. Let's go ahead and do that now in a new window in the editor. So if we resize our command window, oh, sorry, let's move the command window down here. Resize the command window so we can get some more space. Let's make a new file in our editor, so say new script. So first thing as always we'll need to do is to find the sampling rate that we're gonna work at. So let's say fs equals 44,100. Be our sampling rate in Hertz. Next we wanna define the frequency of our waveform. So let's go ahead and do like we did in the first video, frequency 1000 Hertz. So we'll generate a square wave at 1000 Hertz. So for the particular technique that we're gonna to use to generate the square wave, we also need to know the period of the waveform in terms of samples. So we can get this using our frequency and our sampling rate. So let's make a new variable called t. And what we're going to do is first do one divided by the frequency. What this gets us is the amount of time that one waveform takes in terms of seconds. But in order to convert from seconds into samples, we need to multiply by the sampling rate, so times fs. What this is gonna get us is the period in samples. So we can put a comment there that describes that. Now that we know our period, let's go ahead and create the same square wave using the technique that we were just using. So we're gonna say waveform equals ones, one comma, and then let's say floor of t over two. What this floor function is gonna do for us is it's going to round down the argument that we give us. So t over two could have a fractional part. And we need to make sure that it's just a whole number when we're done with it. So let's first do floor in order to round down. So let's close the parentheses for our ones. And then we're going to do comma negative one times ones. And then one row. We're gonna do ceiling, which is the opposite of floor. It rounds up. Let's close our matrix there, the waveform vector. In order to create an in interesting audio signal with the square wave, we need to repeat it a whole bunch of times so that it stretches out and creates a whole signal to us that we can listen to. Since this one waveform is gonna take a very short amount of time, we need a bunch of copies so we can listen to it for a little bit. So in order to do that, let's make a new variable called tone. Let's say tone equals rep mat and waveform comma, let's make it one row, and then let's say copy it a thousand columns wide. 
Now we can write this tone variable to a file like we did before. So let's do wave write, and then tone is the signal that we want to write to a file, the sampling rate fs, and then let's name the file square.wave in single quotes, semicolon. So we'll need to save this first, and let's call this generate square. And let's run it. So again, if I just pull up the regular finder on my system, I can go and listen to the waveform that we created. Here is square.wave. Let's listen to it. Now it sounds really sharp, but it is a square wave. In order to make this a little bit nicer to listen to, let's change the amplitude of the file. So let's give ourselves another parameter, a equals 0 0.5. So in order to make this a little bit more listenable, let's multiply this resulting tone by 0 0.5 so that it comes in at about half, half the amplitude of the original signal. Let's run it again and listen to it. It's a little less hateful. So now we can use this parameter if we wanted to change the volume of our signal. That'll be handy to us in the future. We can also change the frequency of this to anything else that we want. For example, if we want to go an octave down, we can change this to 500 hertz. Now let's say save and run, and listen to our file again. So again, a square wave. This square wave sounds pretty harsh compared to the kind of square wave that we would hear from an analog synthesizer. We'll go over that and other strategies for avoiding aliasing in future videos. But for now, it sounds mostly like a square wave. Let's go ahead and adapt our example so that we can make a saw wave, though, in order to generate some other sounds. So we can keep everything the same, except for we'll want to change what our waveform is. We no longer need the brackets or anything in it, so we can highlight that and delete it. And instead, let's put in a linspace command, starting at negative 1, comma, 1. And then the number of samples that we want in one cycle is t, close parentheses. So let's change the name of our file that we're writing to saw.wave and say save and generate. Now let's pull up the saw wave and listen to it. Again, to compare with the square wave. So there it is. Now if we want to look at a plot of this so we can see what we did, we could say plot tone from 1 to maybe, let's look at the first 200 samples. So this looks like a square wave, right? We have a straight line, a linear signal going from negative 1 to 1, and then a sharp discontinuity that's going to be the source of our aliasing down to negative 1, and repeating again and again forever, or at least until our signal ends. Just to prove a point, let's close this, push the up arrow key to bring back our previous command, and change plot to stem. Again, this is actually what our signal looks like, and if we zoom in on the first cycle, you can see we don't know what the waveform looks like at all points in time. We only know t number of samples in this waveform. T being 88 samples, you can see our waveform is 88 long. It's just taken off the point 2 there at the end. So let's finish out our waveform examples by making a triangle wave. So we can do that using two different lens spaces together. So let's put a left bracket before our lens space and say going from negative 1 to 1 in T over 2 samples, so half of our period. And we'll need another lens space going from 1 to negative 1 in t over 2 samples. And then close that with another square bracket. Let's change the name of our file to triangle. Now save and run. And let's listen to the result. So the triangle wave is much softer, as you can hear, and the discontinuities that we're drawing in there aren't as harsh. So let's draw the stem plot for this. We'll hit up a few times with the command window to go back to st stem of tone from 1 to 200. 
you can see our waveform here generates a triangle wave going from negative 1 up to 1, back down, and repeating for the length of our signal. Let's close this window with the triangle wave. So for those of you who want to play around with this, you can change the amplitude with this A parameter. It should be probably something less than 1 in order to avoid distortion, but 0 point anything below 1 should be good for us. We can also change the frequency to anything that we want and generate a waveform of whatever frequency we feel like. In a future video, I'll show you how to change a MIDI note number to a frequency using a simple formula so that we can create melodies and chords and all kinds of stuff with the signals that we generate in octave. Before I end this video, though, I want to give you a little example of what band limiting looks like and why our square wave sounded kind of funny. So first of all, you can see the square wave without band limiting here, the one that we generated in our example just now that shows you the square wave with the discontinuity, so straight from negative 1 right to 1. This creates some issues for the process converting from digital audio to analog audio that happens when we listen to a sound coming our, from our computer. What we can do to make our lives easier on our computer is create a band-limited square wave. You can see in this part of the figure. So this doesn't look exactly like a square wave, and you can see some weird wiggling going on at the end. The technical term for this is the Gibbs ears. It's a DSP phenomenon that happens to avoid aliasing when we have these sharp discontinuities. We'll talk about that in a future video, but just keep in mind that we what we made here is kind of cheating. We didn't use band limiting and we got some aliasing as a result of it. You could still use this in a few songs if you wanted to, but this one might be more flexible for us in the future. So that brings us to the end of Learn Audio DSP Part 2. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be back before too long with more audio DSP secrets. We'll be talking about aliasing and maybe some sequencing so we can generate some melodies with our waveforms that we've created. Thanks, everyone.